We're looking at alcohol-fueled violence. And we're going to start off with a little bit of background. And for that, we need to know about the case of Thomas Kelly and Kieran Loveridge. This is Thomas Kelly down here. Um, and what we're going to be reading through is actually straight from the court case, which deals with Kieran Loveridge. Thomas Kelly was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He'd just caught a taxi from Town Hall to King's Cross with two female friends to meet some other friends. He was on his mobile phone talking and would have been unsuspecting of any danger. Uh, this is the location in King's Cross where he was over, I think it's Victoria Street and Darlinghurst Road, so uh, a central point of activity in King's Cross. And here we see Kieran Loveridge. Uh, we know that he had been drinking heavily since 5 p.m. on the 7th of July 2012. By 9.30 p.m. that night, he was very drunk and was in an agitated state and beginning to behave aggressively. It's actually known that he said at one point, I just want to go out and punch someone. Okay? He was very aggressive. Um, he was fueled by alcohol, which made his uh, inhibition sort of um, fall a little bit, uh, and he became incredibly aggressive. As Thomas Kelly walked by, Loveridge stepped out from the wall he was standing against and punched him in the face with sufficient force to knock him down. It's important to note this was unprovoked. Like I said, it was basically him acting on his desire to get out and punch someone, and he did so. Um, a scan of Kelly's head later showed a massive fracture on the back of the skull and brain injury. He died two days later in hospital when the life support was disconnected. Now, Loveridge was charged with manslaughter after a plea bargain with prosecutors in which he agreed to plead guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter if murder charges were dropped. Here we see our first key point, which is that of a plea bargain. A plea bargain is where the accused and the prosecutor come to a compromise agreement where the accused will plead guilty to a, a lesser charge. Now, that means it's, it's considered a win-win situation for both sides. The prosecution is ensured of getting a guilty plea, which means they can move straight on to the sentencing phase. They don't have to determine guilt or innocence. They don't have to go through the trial phase to convict someone. Whereas the accused is happy because the murder charge could have meant life imprisonment. Kieran Loveridge avoided this murder charge, it was reduced to manslaughter, and that's why he was willing to bargain, to negotiate, to plead guilty to manslaughter. Say, so I will plead guilty to manslaughter if you drop the murder charge. Uh, on the 8th of November 2013, so we're looking at quite a while after um, the, the events, Justice Campbell of the Supreme Court imposed a sentence of six years in prison. That was in a four-year non-parole period, plus two years potentially on parole. So the headlines were, Kieran Loveridge could be out after four years. Uh, the case was known as R and Loveridge 2013. It's important to remember the year because we're going to look at the appeal later on and the appeal was made in 2014 and you want to be able to differentiate, distinguish between those two. Now, in his judgment, Justice Campbell emphasised rehabilitation as a key aim of punishment, adding that, quote, in my judgment, the offender is very unlikely to reoffend. So his view was that the key thing here is Kieran Loveridge is going to leave prison at some point in the future and when he does, we need to make sure that he's rehabilitated so he does not reoffend. Yeah, we've got a question. Okay, so the, the question here is, if he has committed, he's believed to have committed a murder, why don't we just charge him with murder because that's what he's committed? The difficulty is murder is very difficult to prove. Uh, in this case, um, in particular, keep in mind that murder means you want to go out and you want to kill someone and you do kill someone. That would have been very difficult to prove here because Kieran Loveridge did not go out with the purpose of killing anyone. He went out with the purpose of committing assault. And someone died as a result. And normally that's, committed, that that's considered manslaughter because you went out with the intent purpose of killing, uh, sorry, with, of punching someone, of hurting someone rather than killing them, and then they died. And that's what distinguishes murder from manslaughter. What Thomas Kelly's family argued is if you're being reckless in committing assault, you are complicit, you effectively should know that you could result, uh, your actions could result in the death of someone. And so Thomas Kelly's family actually think that he should have been charged with murder, and they're not happy about this. So uh, they would actually agree with that, um, that assertion that he should have been charged with murder and he might have been found guilty of murder. But that's sort of the background to it. Um, the Department of Public Prosecutions made a judgment call that they would rather be certain of getting a guilty um, verdict for manslaughter than losing out on murder. And to give you an um, alternate case, the Robert uh, G case which was about the Lin family uh, murders, so a family of um, Chinese immigrants in Epping who owned a newsagent, and the family was killed. Um, and Robert Z, there, the brother of the, um, the father of that family, was charged with murder, and he was found not guilty. 
had they charged him with manslaughter, maybe they would have found him guilty. So what the DPP here was concerned about is we would rather get a manslaughter charge with a conviction than charge him with murder and have him found not guilty and walk free. And that's, that's a difficult thing. There's no right or wrong answer in that. Um, in coming to his decision, Justice Campbell attempted to balance a number of aggravating factors and mitigating factors. So an aggravating factor is something that makes a sentence more severe, and a mitigating factor is something that makes a sentence less severe. And here's some examples of those. There were two main aggravating factors. One was Loveridge has not always responded to leniency following past criminal activities, which, quotes, demonstrates a pattern of disregard for the law. So he has committed crimes in the past, and he has continued to commit crimes. That's an aggravating factor. That's not a good sign for him. Number two, Loveridge was um, at conditional liberty at the time of these offences, having been granted 18 months parole. Conditional liberty is something we refer to when you are on parole, when you're on bail, when you're on a suspended sentence. You're, you, you have liberty, but there are conditions attached to it. One of those conditions is don't go out and commit another crime. Not only has he committed another crime, he's killed someone. He's punched Thomas Kelly and Thomas Kelly is now dead. And so that's really, really bad for him because he was supposed to demonstrate by being given leniency that he wasn't going to reoffend. So he was, um, he was doing that before and he was involved in that. Correct. So he'd, he'd been um, charged, I forget with what, I think it was assault and I think he'd gone to, um, to prison and now he was on his parole period or it was a suspended sentence. I forget the exact details, but he was on conditional liberty, which meant we will let you go free but you've got to promise not to commit another offence. The idea of that is it promotes rehabilitation. One thing you've got to remember is the moment you put someone in prison, it exposes them to the very worst elements of society. Prison is not a good way of rehabilitating someone. It's actually a really good way of turning them into a lifelong hardened criminal. And for a young person in particular, and I believe Kieran Loveridge was 18 or 19 at the time, you want to try and avoid ruining them for the rest of their life and turning them into a hardened criminal and you do that by avoiding sending them to prison, where possible. Now, there are some mitigating factors. Number one, Loveridge had a degree of social disadvantage in his upbringing. So if someone's disadvantaged, you, you go a little bit more lenient on them in the hope that, um, that you can provide them with some more assistance, that if someone is let down by society, you don't punish them for that. Number two, Loveridge is remorseful for his offending. So again, in this case, if he had said, yeah, I punched him, and yeah, he died, and I don't care, and I would do it again, he would have gotten a worse sentence. Okay, but because he is remorseful, because he's truly sorry, the law will go more easily on him. That reduces the likelihood of him reoffending because he realizes that what he's, he has done is wrong. And number three, he's young and the courts have an inclination to leniency in the case of a young offender. The purpose of this is to give young offenders a chance. All right, so what happened as a result of this? He's gotten six years in prison. He could be out after four for the manslaughter of Thomas Kelly. It received quite a bit of criticism. So There's quite a bit of criticism that came through. Um, first of all, you had the Department of Public Prosecutions who described the sentence as manifestly inadequate. You're going to see this term come up um, again in the future. Manifest, manifestly inadequate is not long enough for the crime. You do the crime, you do the time. Uh, the Attorney General, who we see here up the top, Greg Smith, stated his intention for the decision to be appealed. Um, Greg Smith's an important individual. Uh, he's um, actually from the, the uh, Christian conservative right wing of the Liberal Party. Um, very conservative, but also has that um, traditional Christian um, compassion about him. So he doesn't believe in being tough on crime for the sake of it to win votes. And we're going to see that he actually starts making arguments to say we, don't, we shouldn't have tougher sentencing laws. It's actually not the solution to this. Um, which is quite unusual, because normally politicians like being very tough on crime, particularly uh, right-wing ones, and he's actually the exception to that. Um, also, the family of Thomas Kelly, there you see his parents at the bottom, they said they, quote, have spent the last hour in court listening to the verdict, which supports the offender, and leaves us as the victim's family completely cold, shocked, and just beyond belief that the sentence was so lenient. They were very, very harsh in, in their view on it, arguing that the law supported the offender more than it supported the victim and their family. Now, the month after that, remember this was November of 2013, we're going to go to December of 2013, New Year's Eve. Daniel Christie, we see here up the top, an 18-year-old was punched and gravely injured by Sean McNeil, who we see at the bottom. 
Uh, he, Daniel Christie, uh, sorry, he, um, Sean McNeil, allegedly punched once in the head, causing him to fall and fracture his skull. McNeil had consumed a large amount of alcohol, and though it doesn't say here, he's also a uh, MMA fighter, so mixed martial arts. You know, his fists are weapons sort of uh, individual. Um, Christie's life support was turned off on the 11th of January, less than two weeks later. He died later that day. And importantly, this incident took place in almost the exact spot where Thomas Kelly had been punched in July 2012. Uh, is this why the laws were introduced in relation to King's Cross in the city? It, it was exactly that. In particular, think about this December of 2013 and uh, November of 2013. They were very close together. There was a huge amount of, of media in relation to this. And up until then, the government was very hesitant to respond uh, with a big measure. They said that we're going to uh, bring in smaller measures like improved transport or more sniffer dogs or more police presence, but they weren't willing to do things like lockouts or mandatory minimum sentencing. And what you're going to see is that after this, the government does choose to introduce those things.